and welcome to Eureka, coming to you from Science Brainwaves and PH7. In the studio today, we have Chris, Ellie, Waylin. This week's episode is all about explosives. We're going to be talking about fireworks, neutron star collision, explosions in nature, and of course, we have the quiz. But coming up first, we have the news. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I'll just run you through this week's news, what's been happening this week in the science world. Um, But before I start, I'd ask you to, did any of you go to a fireworks display? Yeah, we both did. Really? We were both there together, actually. Which one did you go and see? Um, It's the one in the uh, botanical gardens. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I tried to get tickets for that, but I was too late. So we managed to uh, um, get into it because we were volunteering for us for like a... A science outreach store. Oh, okay. But yeah, um, yeah. because by the time we got there, it was around nine, and yeah. the kids mainly have gone home to mm-hmm. sleep, so we kind of just snuck off and went and saw the fireworks. Which was pretty lucky. Yeah. Yeah. Is it good? Oh, they were definitely worth it. Yeah. Cool. Anyway, getting a bit off topic. <laughs> My first bit of news, which I'll bring to you, um, was I thought was pretty interesting. So um, a child who suffered from a rare genetic disease, um, it was called junctional epidermis lysis belusa. I'd never heard of it before. Um, but basically what this disease was is it, it left the, the child with skins really fragile. Um, and actually I was having a look at the statistics and something like half of people with this disease, even though it's really rare, um, die. So it's it's really yeah it's really nasty, but this um, this news comes because for the first time scientists have been able to cure it. So um, basically, they did it through giving the child a, a new genetically modified skin. Um, so let me just run through the actual process they they used. So um, basically, they took a little bit of the boy's skin, um, and then they used a virus. So for those of you that don't know, viruses. Basically, the, the way they survive is they put their own DNA into the host. Um, so scientists can hijack this system, put in like the correct bit of DNA required to form skin correctly, put it into a virus and infect the skin with that virus. And then basically then the, G, the correct gene can be put into the host's DNA. Mm-hmm. So they did this. Um, so they created genetically modified skin, skin cells um, to make skin grafts. And then they covered the patient basically with these skin grafts which were grown up in the lab um, and they covered his whole body it was i think it was 80 percent, but oh. it was enough so that yeah so did they literally just grow sheets and sheets yeah, yeah, of yeah. skin exactly and put him yeah up? Wow. kind of weird in a way but also very useful yeah it's kind of crazy to think that they were just growing it in the in the lab though yeah be a weird image <laughs> i hate to think of anyone like wandering into that lab like, yeah. like, what's going on <laughs> i think it's something out of like a sci-fi movie when i was reading this i was wondering why they didn't use something like crispr though yeah so um again for any of those listeners that, that don't know crispr is this new genetic tool which has been sort of um i don't know it's taken the the world by storm a little bit um and and they it, it uses um it hijacks a bacterial system, doesn't it? Um, to do basically a similar thing, insert right copies of genes into the host. Um, why they didn't use CRISPR, I don't know. I think it's still quite expensive. Um, that's my only guess. I don't know. Do yeah, I, I think I think you're probably right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's 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 like all of, normally right whenever a new scientific technique comes out, it's like really expensive. Like the first time that we sequence the human genome it costs billions and billions of pounds and it takes a long time for like that cost to start dropping yeah anything else that you'd like to add on that new story so i was actually looking into that a bit as well and they've they've want to do that for other diseases oh, right. um another one is like the sickle cell anemia yeah, yeah yeah which is when they have uh these patients suffer from blood cells that are really disformed in shape Mm -hmm. Um, and basically what the the scientists want to do is take out the bone marrow from the patient which is responsible for making the blood cells and then modifying the gene and then hopefully putting it back in so then these patients can get um, normal red blood cells again but um, yeah that's pretty cool yeah I'm sure I'm sure this sort of thing has loads of applications that it could be used for so it's all pretty pretty cool stuff Um, second bit of news um, probably less important, but uh, 
some researchers at the University of Cambridge have found that sheep can recognise human faces. So, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I always wonder like how they get money to do this. Yeah, do you know what yeah. I mean, I, who, who funds this? But anyway, they were able to train sheep to identify the faces of a, a range of people, it included actors Emma Watson um, and the former US President Barack Obama. Um, and it basically, the, the scientists concluded that it shows that sheep possess similar face recognition abilities to primates. And this previously wasn't thought. Um, I think mean, that's brilliant. Have you seen the, there's a video of <laughs> the experiment that was, uh, is great? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did see that. I saw that on the BBC News website, actually. Yeah. It, it's the sort of like science that like, it, it really entertains a lot of the public. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not, I'm not really sure what application it has, other than it's interesting. But I was, I was watching it and I was like, I was really amazed at the sheep and how like, as in, so they show, what they do is they show the two pictures, uh, one would be like Barack Obama and the other one would, the other photo would look similar, but not Barack Obama. Yeah. And the sheep um, would always go towards Barack Obama and then they'd also get a food reward. But the first time the sheep went towards the Barack Obama, I was just like, this is amazing, like, <laughs> they're so intelligent. Yeah. So face recognition isn't seen in a lot of animals. Um, it's, it's really only primates, obviously. The other ones are elephants, um, and I think also a couple of um, aquatic mammals can do it too. So I think, like, dolphins can. Um, but on the whole, it's actually not that common. So it goes to show how intelligent sheep are, I suppose. I just wonder how what kind of impact this sort of research will have, or will you look at a sheep differently? I mean, the, the only way that I can think that this would have a wider application is just through, if, if, if you have a, a better knowledge of which sort of animals and which sort of brains are able to process human faces, you can do better comparative brain anatomy studies so you could we could now look at a sheep's brain for example and and see where, which bits of the brain might be responsible for facial recognition whereas that might have been harder using like a primate's brain for example um i'm f probably sure that the laws around the ethical laws around sheep and sort of dissecting sheep is probably slacker than primates that would be my guess. It might change now, though, considering yeah. they can recognise Barack Obama's yeah. face. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Third bit of news. Um, I thought this was a bit of positive news. I've previously been criticised, actually, by um, by people in your position um, for only delivering depressing scientific news. <laughs> so um, this is something a little bit more cheery. This is the UK's current environmental minister... Michael Gove, um, is planning to ban the controversial pesticides um, which are being blamed for the decline in bees, um, so, and they're called neonicotinoids, something like that. Does that seem right? Is that, yeah. is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. Um, so it was actually in 2013, in the light of scientific evidence, um, the EU banned these pesticides, but the UK didn't um, go along with this ban. They sort of took up their own stance um, and decided that there wasn't enough evidence. But now, four years later, four years? Yeah, four years later, um, the UK government has finally recognised the scientific um, research which has linked these pesticides to the decline in bees. That's yeah. great then. Yeah, that's... I, I don't know quite what research has suddenly come out which has made Michael Gove change his mind. Um, but it's a positive nonetheless. Um, and of course, um, we should all be concerned that the, the bees are dropping. Um, the main reason is that they're very important pollinators. So um, I have here that the food industry in Britain is worth 100 billion a year. Um, so wow. if we start to see dropping in pollinators, um, not only is there sort of a... Uh, sort of a guilty reason that we should be doing something about this but there is also like financial reasons yeah um, yeah which i imagine is what michael gove would be concerned about yeah um, that's good it's good positive news though yeah, yeah no, it's good i'm i'm glad uh, it's <laughs> it is hard sometimes to find some good scientific news normally a lot of it is just like <laughs> things going extinct or in fact i think that two weeks ago we reported that 75 percent drop in insect numbers which was insane, like, it, in the last 30 years. Um, 
So I think that brings you quite nicely yeah, to, the, exactly, to, the, exactly. to the next point. So hopefully um, this uh, political decision will go somewhere to stopping the halt in insect numbers dropping. Um, and the fourth bit of news that I'll bring you is that a new species of orangutan has been discovered. Um, Ooh. Yeah, so um, I, I think I, they're so charismatic. I love orangutans. I think they're probably my favourite ape. So apparently they're seven times stronger than the average human. Really? Which is astonishing. Seven times stronger. But I think they're Just huge. Like, they're like all muscle though, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. And like and the, the males are so much bigger than the females too. Mm. So I wonder whether it's, I don't know. I wonder whether it's biased a little bit by the males. Did you, did you ever see the uh, the Jungle Book, the new one? Yeah. And the giant um, <laughs> oh, yeah. orangutan. Yeah. That was terrifying to be fair. <laughs> um... So when, when we say that this a new species of orangutan has been discovered, it's not it's not the case that we've scientists have suddenly found orangutans living somewhere that they didn't think. They've always been aware of this population of orangutans, and it's just now that DNA and and skeletal analysis have have they realised that it's actually its own species. Um, so it's kind of similar to a bit of British news that there was a fourth species of snake discovered in the UK, but it, it wasn't a game that like we've just discovered this rare snake. It, it's more the fact that we've realised that what we thought was previously one species is actually two. Nevertheless, the scientists have called it the Tapunyuli orangutan. I think that's right. Um, and the estimates is that fewer than 800 exist. Um, Scientists first suspected that this orangutan may be separate from the other orangutans in 2013 when they got their hands on a skeleton and they noticed differences in the skull and teeth of the individual. Um, so the Tapunuli <laughs> orangutan um, had a shorter jaw joint. And then later DNA sequences um, that basically confirmed their suspicions. Um, I thought what was interesting is by comparing the DNA sequences of the now three species of orangutan, so the other two are the Sumatran and Bornean, they've worked out that the Tapanuli orangutans um, were probably the first migrants into the Borneo region, um, and that the other two species of orangutan living there were later migrants from mainland Asia. So... From what is it? So orangutans only live on two islands, right? So you're yeah, saying they so, moved? Yeah, yeah. How did they migrate across? No idea. No idea. I, it was not even that long ago. So um, the scientists estimated it to be 3.4 million years ago. So perhaps sea levels were slightly different, and I, I imagine that the seas around can, those can islands. Can they swim? I. That would be a funny sight. I think they can swim, but like. Like, did you see the sloth swimming? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> in Planet Earth Planet 2, Earth. yeah. That was the best thing I think I saw. <laughs> I've seen. Yeah. I mean, maybe maybe they can swim, but it's like, how far can they swim? Would they swim across an ocean? I, I don't know why they would want to. Um, or maybe that, like, the classic idea is for, like, these sort of land animals and their migrations is they get stuck on, like, a raft, which... I, maybe happens ever so often um <laughs> just like just like a couple of orangutans being <laughs> yeah. like oh no we're stuck <laughs> yeah and then slowly moving towards a new place yeah relocation mm. who knows who knows how it happened but it happened um yeah um i think that's all i have in news. No, no, no no that's interesting stuff yeah any of you seen anything in the news that you'd like to add um not on the top of my head actually no no no. All right then. Well, that concludes the news. So we're on to our first discussion now, and that's about the science behind fireworks. So the Chinese invented fireworks somewhere between 960 and 1279 AD, and they used these fireworks to ward off evil spirits and for celebrations like the emperor's birthday and Chinese holidays. That's so designing cool. and I, I didn't realize that it would be that long ago yeah it seems you know what i mean quite... i feel like it's quite a, a modern in invention for some reason i don't know why yeah there's no reason that an explosion should be a modern invention but mm. <laughs> i just i don't know i see the way like the fireworks go off and i think that must involve some really like high-tech chemistry no so what i've actually what i read was actually there was a theory that um 
the Chinese, uh, some alchemists um, in China were trying to create like this kind of potion that was immortality to, mm. to give you immortality. And um, they accidentally mixed the chemicals that basically made gunpowder oh, and yeah. it started exploding everywhere. And so I think they just pr pretty much accidentally discovered it. Crazy. Um, As so many things are, so many things are Some of the best accidental. inventions. Yeah. Probably yeah. the total opposite of what they wanted to make. Yeah. Just like an explosion in a bottle. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, carry on. So um, there's different metal elements and metal compounds are used to create different colours. So blue-greens and vivid violet blues are the most dangerous and difficult to create because they're very unstable and very dangerous. So, for example, green is created by barium, orange by calcium salts, blue by copper, red by lithium or stronium, bright white by magnesium and gold by sodium. And the use of different elements can also create some special effects, like sparkler effects by aluminium, glitter effects by antimony. And colour can be deepened by calcium. You can get some glow-in-the-dark effects by phosphorus, silver sparks by titanium and smoke by zinc. That's cool. So, is that... Th do they use these... Actually, I've just noticed a firework go off on the horizon. Yeah, is, uh, they've been going on for like, ages. It's it like so long. It's, I don't know why. It's like a week before fireworks night and then a week after. I don't know why it has to go on so long. But anyway, so, it's so you know when you have like a firework and it creates like, I don't know, some of them are like s sort of spray out and some of them are like spherical almost like spherical bangs is, is all of that stuff also done by chemistry do you know uh i think the effects like that are like obviously the different colors you do a different element and like the shape it makes is like dependent on how it's packed in oh, the okay. shell okay. kind of thing yeah 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 that makes more sense and and also is is how high up they go in the sky is that also to do with the chemistry or is that to do with like how they light it on the floor uh, potentially, maybe how much like actual like gunpowder they yeah. have, maybe. I don't know. No, if if any of you listeners know, please tweet us. <laughs> on, I'm trying to remember our Twitter handle. I think it's called at Eureka on Forge. Um, it's going to be niche knowledge, but <laughs> someone out there might know. Exactly, some yeah. physicist maybe. Yeah. Anyway, carry on. Carry so on. inside our firework. We have some black powder, which acts as the propellant. It's made from potassium nit nitrate, sulfur and charcoal. So when it's ignited, the nitrate oxidizes the sulfur and charcoal, which results in some hot gases. It contains mortar, which is the outer cylinder chamber, you just usually made of plastic or metal. And it contains stars. These are the pyrotechnic compounds that explode and create the colors and effects. They're usually spheres, cubes, or cylinders about the size of a pea or as big as a tennis ball. And then they also contain a shell, which is a hollow sphere made of pasted paper and string. And this is cut in half and packed with the stars. And then inside our shell with our stars, we've got our bursting charge inside the middle, which ignites the firework. The charge ignites the outside of the stars and they burn, which causes showers of sparks. Then finally, we've got our fuse, which allows a time delay for the explosion. Otherwise, the firework would just go off as soon as you lit it, mm. which wouldn't be ideal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, have you, have, have either of you ever seen like a, an accident at a, at a firework display? No, but I did uh, do some um, with my dad on top of this. Uh, we went to this hill and we had some fireworks. Okay, yeah, yeah. And as soon as we set them off, um, they kind of fell over and just fired towards us. And we had to, like, Ooh. dive behind a, a bench and everything. Like, I've never seen my dad move so quickly. Yeah, I I was at a firework display when I was quite little. And a firework, like, one of the stands, which they light them, fell over. Oh. And, it, and it, it said, obviously, instead of going up in the sky, it came towards the crowd. Um, Did anyone didn't, get hurt? No, it didn't hurt anyone, thankfully. But I do always wonder, like, how often people get hurt at firework displays, whether it happens that much. 
Yeah, because that's just like hearing the description <laughs> of how the firework is made. It sounds pretty, still pretty primitive. Like, yeah, sounds exactly. like a pipe filled with yeah. cardboard well, with also loads of chemicals and Chloe, like the BSA um, stand that we were helping at, yeah, makes her own. So clearly, it can't be that difficult. Yeah, right? she was saying after the um, after she went home from the uh, the firework display we saw, yeah. she was like, "I'm just going to make my own. I've got a couple <laughs> chemicals in the back of my shed, and I'm just going to mix As them together." Do. Yeah, why not? Sounds a bit. Suspicious, but she was making fireworks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. sure. It's probably one of the better things she can make behind the shed. Huh. Anyway, so how, how do they create the effects and colours in one firework? Well, so you have multi-break shells that create multiple stages for the fireworks. So we've got stars of different colours and compounds that are used to make the different effects. And the shells are filled with other shells will have multiple sections that are ignited with individual fuses. After the first section bursts, the next fuse is ignited and bursts. Oh, okay. And then it ignites the next and so on. Okay. That's cool. And patterns are created when um, the stars are thrown out in a various pattern. So they'll be packed in a way, maybe like a happy face pattern or like a star pattern. And they'll maintain their shape in the sky as they're thrown out from the shell. Hmm. I wonder what's the best shape they've made for the mm. uh, firework. Or like, yeah, how complicated. Have either of you seen The Lord of the Rings? Yeah. Yeah, so you know the, the, the scene at the start with Bilbo Baggins is having his... Oh, party, yeah, yeah. And it turns into a dragon and yeah, no. at the Hobbit. So I wonder if something like that is, could be remotely possible. Yeah, or maybe just a huge Barack Obama and all his sheep in, <laughs> in the cross of the country. You'd be like, oh. Yeah, there he is. Yeah. Um, so do, do fireworks have any use outside of, like, an entertainment... Um, yeah, so yeah. they're used in the military still um, okay. as flares, because even though we've got all our new age of like satellite navigation and radar, most ships will still carry these flares as like a backup mm -hmm. method to yeah. signal distress. But do you reckon more flares are let off like during the festivals or at football games than probably in real life? I feel <laughs> like they're definitely used yeah, more. I reckon so. Yeah. yeah. It's funny, isn't it? When things pick up a, I'm trying to think of an example I'm thinking of things where they've like got a use which isn't for what they invented them for yeah um, oh, I, uh, duct tape duct tape was um, originally invented to basically stick things together in space they needed like when they were <laughs> like the first spaceships they wanted like a really durable thing which they could like do repairs on and so they asked a scientist to come up with it and the scientist developed duct tape um, and it was and it was really only advertised to, to NASA for their space stuff. Um, and then it was only afterwards that um, they made it available to the general public and it made them yeah. millions. Nah. They must have uh, invested so much money. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. Now it's used to tie up freshers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very it's different. Yeah. Very different. Or like Verrucas, you put duct tape over Verrucas to stop them breathing. That's oh, I've never heard that before. Oh, and maybe it's just me. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on quickly, please. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to now go through the chemistry behind fireworks. So essentially, an exploding firework is a number of chemical reactions happening simultaneous or in a rapid sequence. So when you add some heat, you provide enough activation energy which is basically the energy that kickstarts a chemical reaction to make solid chemical compounds packed inside the firework combust with oxygen in the air and they convert themselves into other chemicals releasing smoke and exhaust gases such as carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide and nitrogen in the process. Cool. A lot of gases. It mm. is. Yeah. But it's not just these chemicals turning into other chemicals. They're the energy locked inside them is being converted into four other kinds of energy. So it gets converted into heat energy, light energy, sound energy, and obviously the kinetic energy when they shoot up into the air. Mm. Mm -hmm. It always, when I, whenever I go to a photo display, it always reminds me how slow sound actually travels. You know, when you like, when it yeah. goes off and the bang doesn't actually come to us, like almost like several seconds yeah. after you see it. Um, I always think it's a neat example of that's, that how slow sound actually travels. I really like the sound of 
a f- the fireworks. There's some that are like literally make the the really loud like mm. kind of screeching noise. Yeah, and I yeah. think they're they're really satisfying. Yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah. Kind, of, but also kind of like tension building. Yeah, you know but what I mean, as in they shouldn't be that enjoyable to listen to, mm. but they just. I, I do know what you mean. I feel like we all just turn into kids when you're watching a fight because we're in the crowd and everyone's just going ooh <laughs> ah and everyone's just like clapping at every other moment. It was it was it was really fun. Mm. It was. Do we have anything else on on the science behind fireworks? Before yeah, we I've just got a bit more of the physics behind them. Yeah, go for it. So physics can also explain why a firework shoots into the air. The charge is little more than a missile. As it burns, the firework is powered by action and reaction, which is also known as Newton's third law of motion for all you physicists out there. Mm. In exactly the same way as a space rocket or jet engine is is the same way that a firework is set up. So when the powder packed into the charge burns, it gives off hot exhaust gases that fire backwards. The force of the exhaust gases firing backwards is like the blast coming out of a rocket engine and creates an equal and opposite reaction force that sends the fireworks shooting up into the air. Cool. Is that everything you want to say? I just have one little oh, bit yeah, more go, to add. Yeah, yeah, go for it. So you might notice when fireworks go off, they're always symmetrical. Mm. So you wouldn't have more on more sort of sparks or whatever on the left side than the right. That's basically another law of physics called conservation of momentum, which means basically the amount of stuff moving in each direction must be the same before and after an explosion. So oh. explosions to the left must be exactly balanced by explosions to the right. So is oh. that one of the reasons that we know the Big Bang started at the centre of the universe? It could be. I guess. Who knows? That's what I've presume from that is if a, if a bang started the universe and then all momentum has to go out evenly across the oh yeah that would make yeah, sense makes yeah. sense yeah cool I'm glad we've had this discussion actually because I always worry that this radio show kind of excludes physics and chemistry yeah. because most people that come on and present are biologists mm. so that was a cool one to have yeah right I think it's the quiz up next time for the quiz okay woohoo <laughs> Okay, it's time for the quiz. Woohoo. So the first question up is, what does TNT stand for? But first, you've got to tell me um, what noise you're going to make when you want to buzz in. What are you going for? Um, let's go for boom. Yeah? Yeah. Makes sense. It goes okay. with the theme of the yeah. week. Um, I'm going to go with um, bang. It's kind of similar, yeah. but we'll run with it. I'm excited, this is, a, this is my first ever quiz. <laughs> they are the highlight. They're basically why I choose to spend my Friday evenings doing this. <laughs> You're going down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the first option is try nitro toluene. B, try ethanol butane. C, try cycle wheeling. Or D, try methanol butane. Boom. Okay. I think you just I think you just stole my sound. <laughs> I can't remember which one. I meant bang. Um, I mean I could take your answer. <laughs> I I'm g- I think I'm gonna go with D. D um I can tell you that's incorrect. Oh. The correct answer was A, try nitro toluene. Oh. Doesn't sound very scary at all. No. Mm. Who knows? TNT is yeah. better. Yeah. yeah. Question two. Which nation is commonly attributed to inventing fireworks? A, Greece, B, Italy, C, China. Boom. All right. China? Correct. Yeah, should have been listening to that. <laughs> definitely, we definitely had that one come up. <laughs> <laughs> Three. According to Wikipedia, what is a neutron star? A, a neutron star is any star which has had a big ex- explosion. B, a neutron star is a star made totally of neutrons. C, a neutron star is the collapsed core of a large star which before collapse had a total of between 10 and 29 solar masses. Bang. Chris? C? Correct. Yes, a neutron star is the collapsed core of a large star that had between 10 and 29 solar masses. Yeah, I should have. I should have known that. That's my. That's my well, section I, coming um, up. <laughs> I wondered whether th- I was. I was going to go with that, but I wondered whether there was another going to be like a fourth option, which would have had slightly different figures. I thought James was going to trick us out again. <laughs> yeah. uh, no. 
Question four. Bombardier beetles create explosions, but why? A, to mate over longer distances. Um, bang. I think it's, yeah. Um, I'm going to go in without listening to the, the, all the options. Um, as a defense mechanism against potential predators. Correct. You got the answer before I even read it out. <laughs> it, it may have something to do with that they come up later in my section. Yeah. Rather than just an innate knowledge. That's before you had an ex yeah. Yeah. <laughs> expertise. It's very, very niche beat. knowledge yeah. there. <laughs> Question five. Which German chemist first prepared TNT in 1863? A. Julius Wilbrand. B. Augustus Wornman. C. Tiberius Walmart. Or D. Caligus Wilstock. Boom. I'm going to go with C just because it sounds like a pretty funny name. Uh -uh. It oh. was Julius Wilbrandt. Uh. What was C again, though? Uh, C was Tiberius Walmart. That would have been a great name. Yeah. It's a good name. It's hard to pronounce. <laughs> Question six. Which Swedish chemist and engineer first pre prepared dynamite? Oh my goodness, this looks a hard <laughs> answer to say. Just go for a, it. A. A. Philbert Jorvik. Mm -hmm. B. Aethelbert Wise. C. Alfred Noble. Or D. Edward Eldon. Bang. I'm going to go with A. You're going with Aethelbert Jorvik. Yeah, I just feel like James, our quiz writer, wouldn't have made up that name. Well, I, I, he, I think he did. Uh, the correct answer was Alfred Noble. Wow. Well, he wasn't a very noble guy. No. <laughs> You're all weak. Right, question seven. The 2017 film Explosion features an explosion in what environment? A, a mole. B, a mine. <laughs> C, a museum. Or D, a mongoose. Bang. Chris. Okay. I'm going to go with mine. You're correct. Yeah. I just felt like, <laughs> unless it's one of these stupid films, it, it seems like the only one which would yeah. have a plot that would work. How do you get the, the option for the mole? I, <laughs> I couldn't think of it as like a mole on your face or like an animal. Yeah. Who knows? Um, um, like a shopping mole. Oh, oh a mole. Oh, yeah. oh find a conflict mole. of accents here. This is a weirder option. Yeah. <laughs> that makes more sense. <laughs> Um, question eight. In the 1997 film Blast, involves a janitor saving the Olympic swim team of which country? A. Jamaica, B. United Kingdom, C. China, or D. United States? Boom. Bang. I'm in. Um, I'm going to go for China. China an option? Uh, China was an option, <laughs> but the answer was the United States. Oh, oh. It's, um, it's rare that a movie kind of dumbs the United States down. <laughs> movies beat them up. <laughs> well, probably to do with most movies are made in Hollywood, but uh, fair enough. Question nine. The TV show The Big Bang Theory features which of these characters? A. Chris Potato. <laughs> B. Long John Crisp. C, Spud the Scarecrow, or D, Sheldon? Boom. Sheldon. Correct. Quick do, fire do, do, questions. Do, do, do either of you like the Big Bang Theory? I always ask. So yeah, I do. I, do I, I sometimes have it on in the background. Uh, yeah, it is, always, yeah. it is always on. I used to find it really funny, but now I can't stand it. Yeah, I, I had the same thing. So I, I started off watching it because... It kind of filled the hole when Friends got taken yeah, off E4. Yeah. But then after a while, it just got a bit boring, yeah, I think. Yeah, it does get kind of repetitive. Maybe it is just because it's on all the time and it's a bit overkill. Yeah. Mm. Oh, well. Anyway, carry on. I don't actually know what the scores are. I no, I, I haven't really been no, keeping oh, well, score. Yeah. I mean, we're just playing for fun here. So. Are we? Yeah. Are we? <laughs> yeah. So, quick fire questions now. Question 10. Spell explosion, but replace every letter T with the letter S. Boom. I mean X, even. Oh, um, <laughs> e, X, P, L, O, S, I, O, N, S. Wait, what? So, <laughs> what was... <laughs> replace the what, sorry? Replace. So spell explosion, but replace the letter T with the letter X. 
There isn't a letter T. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I think it's a trick question. So did, uh, surely I got it right? I think you did. Oh, Congrats. James, what is, what is that question? I'll have a word with you later. Question 11. <laughs> How loud is an average firework nearest to? Oh, what, we've just got to... <laughs> yeah. yeah, in decibels. Oh. oh, in decibels. I w- really wouldn't have a clue. I'm going to go... Wait, is this sort of at the firework itself or to the person watching it? Mm, maybe Would... the firework itself. Okay. I, um, I really don't have any... No. Any grass. I'm going to go with 500. Whoa. Oh, big it... number. <laughs> I, think I'm, I think I'm going to go a bit lower. I think I'm going to go... Actually, quite a lot lower. 100, okay. maybe. 100. I'd say, Waylon, you're closest. <laughs> it's 150 decibels. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think 500 would just blow your eardrums. But, but, uh, is there anything that reaches 500 decibels? I maybe like some kind of jet. Jet, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I really have no. Grasp no, I, 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 I just kind of. Yeah. Fair enough. Right. Question twelve. They're, they're taking the piss now. <laughs> Are explosions normally hot? Um. This feels like a trick question. I'm still going to get But it. I'm going to say yes. <laughs> oh, you're both correct. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Question 13. If something is explosive, it normally has a little triangle on it with a picture of a ball blowing up. This is a <laughs> warning sign to indicate that it's of an explosive nature. Normally, what colour is this warning sign? Orange. Some sort of... Orange with a red border, yeah. 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 Oh, you're close. It's, it's yellow. Okay. Yeah, I feel that's maybe just sort of... Well, you'd imagine an explosion. Yeah, yeah, I can sort of imagine the picture. I would have called it orange, but whatever. I'll go with it. <laughs> Question 14. Spell explosion, but replace every letter with a T. <laughs> with a what? A, a T. T. <laughs> James. D, T, 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 T. Yeah, correct. 90s. 90s. Yeah. And finally, I think he was just trying to make you say T very <laughs> quickly on the yeah. he's on the mic. Be, he's gonna, he's, James is going to listen in when this episode's produced and just skip to that moment. <laughs> he's saying T lots of times. It's really and trolling us here. <laughs> yeah. Last question. Last right? question. Yeah. Um, this is quite a long one. Peter Andre <laughs> has decided to invite his good friend Stephen Hawking around to watch a film with him. Peter knows that Stephen loves films with loads of explosions in. <laughs> Peter also knows that Stephen had a bad experience when he was at school. One day, Stephen was going to store his physics books in one of those storage places that students have at school when it fell over and hurt him. (laughs) Peter knows that Stephen would like a chance to hurt one of those storage places back. Which film should Peter and Stephen watch together? The film with, about um, Stephen Hawking? And um, what's it called? The Theory of Everything. Yeah. I feel like he should watch... I really don't know. To hurt a storage space. Yeah, yeah. The clue is in that. To hurt... The Hurt Locker. Yeah. Yes. Oh, <laughs> nice. That's a good one. Yeah. Uh, That's a good one. <laughs> good one, James. Good one, James. I don't know what the final scores were. We call it a draw. Yes. I think it was about even. Probably, cool. Yeah. That wraps up the quiz. Uh, our next discussion is going to be uh, pretty physics heavy. It's going to be on the neutron star collisions. Right. So, uh, fitting in with this week's theme, uh, I'm going to talk about the neutron star collisions. Mm-hmm. Um, just a disclaimer: I'm not a physicist, and I, I know I know very little. But I'm going to try my best to yeah, explain go it. Go for it. So um, in August 2017, there was quite an exciting news that the first neutron star collision was recorded and uh, specifically the gravitational waves um, were were recorded. Um, So this was only made possible by the gravitational wave detector Mm -hmm. that made the headlines last year. um, And this proved the existence of gravitational waves. So gravitational waves are ripples in space traveling outward from a source. They're caused by some of the most violent processes in the universe, such as a neutron star collision. Yeah. Um, do any of you guys know anything about gravitational waves? I I know that Einstein predicted them. No. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. Like he he presumed that it would be something that was predictable but never observable because 
the measurements that require to detect a gravitational waves you just assumed would never be able to be made yeah, yeah. Enough. you cannot see them they're just mm. there in space yeah. like warping space time yeah. so bigger objects have a bigger effect on it than yeah. smaller ones mm. it's kind of crazy because i just don't ash- i just can't get my head around that like gravity yeah could be a wave such an abstract concept yeah it, it is I've, and I've, i think i've read <coughs> some people thought that gravity might travel faster at the speed of light um when they first started thinking about gravity as a wave um but it doesn't it travels at the speed of light so light and gravity travel yeah at the same speed i think i'm pretty sure that's that's what they what they've also found but anyway carry on <laughs> so um what are neutron stars so neutron stars are the they're the leftover cores of uh, big stars that have actually exploded and um, they've gone supernova. So those cores are just the size, the right. if they're the right size, say 1.1 to 1.6 times the mass of the sun, as they were in this case, then they get squeezed down by gravity until the electrons merge with protons to form these neutrons and neutrinos. These neutri- neutrinos take off, leaving the neutrons in a really, really densely packed star. And then... So a piece of neutron star the size of a sugar cube would weigh as much as a mount as Mount Everest, um, except they tend to be about twenty kilometers in diameter. That's, okay. that's really heavy. Wow. Yeah. So I guess that's because they've compacted so much. Mm. I I just can't imagine how something so small could weigh so so much. I know. There's so much of this sort of physics. Yeah. It's like just so unimaginable. I think the space between like atoms themselves has like collapsed, so they're just that dense. That... Mm. Yeah, my biologist mind is <laughs> cannot comprehend. So, what happened during the first recorded neutron star collision? So, the discovery of the first neutron star collision all began on August the seventeenth at eight forty one a.m. Eastern time when LIGOs inferometers. So, this stands for Laser Inferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. Um, they detected a clear gravitational wave signal lasting a hundred seconds, okay. which is which is nothing. Yeah, but also, I, I, if someone had said how long would a gravitational wave be detected yeah. for, I would have one thought actually it would have been hardly any time at all, as in it would have just passed. Yeah, you know, I, I can't get. I don't know. They can the detectors they have at the moment can only really detect like really strong waves like right, when okay. the stars were actually about to collide. Like, yeah. So, so I I read into a bit about how these detectors work, and so from what I think of it is is they have these mirrors that are hung by are hung by like strings. Um, well, they're actually massive mirrors, but um, they have lasers that. The beam gets split by a splitter, mm. and then one goes off at a right angle, and then the other the other split goes straight on through a like a I think like a, a vacuum pipe that is about a mile long. Mm. Yeah. And then what is suspected to happen is these gravitational waves have an effect on the Earth to like kind of stretch it and shri- um, shrink it um, at very minuscule um, forces, mm. and this kind of diffracts. Or changes the intensity of the light of the laser that bounces back. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and so this is how they detected it. Yeah, I've, um, I've heard that. Um, I, I sort of always understood it as if there was no force disrupting the laser, it would bounce where it would be. Where it would bounce between the same spot between yeah. the two mirrors. Whereas if the force has disrupted it, it will bounce back at not quite the same place as well yeah so i think that's i think there's a bit more complicated um details because i think that they look at the wave of the laser and then yeah the oscillations um it's all very but it's just, it must just be such minute details yes but yeah. um yeah oh yep yeah, carrying on um so this was the first time they detected the gravitational waves from something other than black holes merging um and something we could see with telescopes too Um, By searching with the telescopes, astronomers could pinpoint exactly which galaxy the waves were coming from. Um, This galaxy is called NGC 4993, which is about 130 million light years away. I I really wish they could have named these galaxies a bit better. (laughs) It's so unimaginative, isn't it? um, So this discovery meant that we could get our first look up close to an explosion of radioactive material produced by a neutron star collision, um, which is also known as a kilonova. Mm Mm-hmm. 
So there's actually a lot to see during a killer nova. Um, these can put out everything from X-rays to visible light to also radio waves. Um, and so 1.7 seconds after the initial detection of gravitational waves, NASA's Fermi Gamma Ray Telescope detected a gamma ray burst brighter than a thousand suns. Scientists have thought that the gamma ray bursts come from neutron star collisions for decades, but the evidence has been lacking up until now. So I, I guess the discovery was was pretty revolutionary. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, the new observations with light telescopes have shown that some of these heavy elements like gold, lead, and platinum were can be made in these sort of events. And uh, this sort this can help us understand where a lot of the heavy elements in our universe come from. Okay, yeah. Um, and so th- it was suspected that this one collision could have produced up to a hundred times the Earth's mass in gold. Crazy. Wow. So, like, the earrings I'm wearing right now, they could have come from a neutron star collision. Yes, they could have. Um, and so I guess the key to the discovery was to know for sure that the gravitational waves um, and the gamma ray bursts observed came from the same event. Um, and the key here was to locate where in the sky this neutron star collision occurred. Um, And because unlike the collision of black holes, these neutron stars emit light when they crash together and they will keep on emitting this electromagnetic radiation afterwards. Um, So NASA's Fermi Gamma Ray Telescope this time identified a large patch of the sky about the size of 6,000 full moons, which is, I guess, a very large patch. Um, And then they use European Space Agency's integral gamma ray satellite um, to narrow down the range. The gravitational waves detected by LIGO were then allowed to identify two narrow strips in the sky, one of which overlapped with the existing search area. And um, actually, interestingly, Virgo, which is a new gravitational wave detected in Italy, was also online at the time, but um, they saw no gravitational waves. Huh. How come? Maybe there's not as not as good as LIGO's one. But... And then the, the waves were coming in, I think, just at the right angle, so they didn't pick them up. <laughs> oh, right. So, wow. That must be billions Just of pounds down the drain. Such a coincidence. <laughs> yeah. But I think that was what helped them find where the collision happened because they used the lack of seeing something to mean that that's where it was, if you see yeah, what yeah, I mean. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, so like a like knowing there's like a blind spot sort yeah. of thing. Mm. That's very clever, actually. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, from doing this, they, they narrowed down the search to 144 um, moons uh, in size. And then within that area, 50 galaxies were identified to be studied with optical telescopes. And finally, just after, just 11 hours after the initial detection, the astronomers detected a bright spot in galaxy 9GC4993, which is where they thought this Mm. neutron star collision was happening. So so, mm, maybe that, does that prove that actually the gravitational waves do travel faster than the speed of light? Or was it just the fact that it took 11 hours for them to set up the telescope to look towards that universe, that galaxy? That yeah, sense. that's a good point. Do you know, um, so if, if they're only seeing the light 11 hours after the detection of the gravitational waves, was that because the gravitational waves came fast than the light? Or was it just because it I took 11 hours? Maybe ha- it just took them that long to locate yeah. the galaxy. Yeah. That- yeah I well, think- I mean, they're looking at 50 galaxies, yeah. so... Yeah, it must mean that. Yeah. Because I'm pretty sure gravitational waves don't travel faster than the speed of light. Because the light came from the gamma ray burst, and that apparently happened 1.7 seconds after the like initial Oh, okay. So. Okay, yeah. Yeah. right, wow. So, so actually, the detection of these gravitational waves have uh, really excited physicists because mm. they basically think it'd be like a new tool to kind of, well, look into the universe a bit more yeah. because, for example, light can penetrate can't penetrate quite a lot of things as in you can block out light quite easily but whereas gravitational waves can travel through everything so they kind of want to harness that to look into more of the more into space Mm -hmm. um and yeah so this was the first chance to prove that a lot of stuff that physicists had predicted for decades such as the gravitational waves the killer novas and the creation of heavy elements and gamma ray bursts um was proven with this with this discovery and um, as we get our new gravitational wave detectors up and running, astronomers expect to see plenty more of these collisions along with these other types of gravitational waves just in the next few years. Um, and, it's, and it's really a phenomenal time to be studying the universe and we're going to be learning a lot about it um, pretty soon. Cool. Wow. That's, that's two discussions in a row which haven't been about biology. Yeah. Which may be a record. I don't know how I managed to fit neutron no. stars into 10 minutes, but I'm <laughs> sure there's a lot more out there. Yeah, well... Well done. 
Cool, let's move on. So the next discussion is going to be on the explosions uh, in nature. Okay, so I'm just going to have a discussion about explosions in nature. So we're coming back more into my comfort zone and talking about <laughs> biology. Um, so the first example of an explosion in, in nature, which I'll touch on, um, we mentioned earlier in the quiz, so it's the example of the bombardier beetles, um, which have a great name. Um, and basically as a defence against certain predators, they let out a jet of boiling hydrochloric acid out of their abdomen t towards the predator. Um, and it, this normally kills them. Um, it's that strong, that hot. In fact, even to a human, it will burn. Wow. Um, My goodness. How do, they, how do they fire it out? Do they kind of have to go on their, their leg? Like a Where hand does it yeah. come from? Yeah, so it, it, I assume it comes from... Do beetles have an anus? I, think it, I assume I it think, comes from... Yeah. yeah, I mean... I think it comes from there. Yeah, because abdomen makes it sound like it might be on its bottom, but I guess yeah. <laughs> just imagine it handstanding. Yeah, and I think, yeah, I think it does it. kind of like maybe it lift, jumps. And yeah, like I think it does lean on its front legs to lift its rear up towards its prey. Um, so, apart from being an incredible show of what evolution can do, um, it's also a subject which has interested lots of other people. So some physicists and um, people people like that and maybe like materialistic... Materialistic? Is that the right word? Like material scientists. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, um, Just not, not scientists that like to do a lot of shopping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, material scientists. Um, I've also been really interested in this because it's really difficult to understand how the the, the insect is structured so that it can withstand yeah. boiling hydrochloric acid in its abdomen. Yeah, like, that's what I was thinking. How does it not just kill itself? Exactly. So, um, scientists have began to understand this. So, they used um, state-of-the-art X-ray imaging technology. It's known as a synchrotron and a camera recording the action um, at 20,000 frames per second. So they basically used a lot of expensive kit and to work out um, exactly how the beetle does it. So um, in terms of the reaction itself, vapour feels a very... Uh, the, the chamber inside the insect. And then the insect injects just a reactant droplet into the chamber, um, which fires up the heat, and then the liquid is released out of the back end of the beetle. Um, and actually, it's a passive process for the beetles. The beetles don't actually think about it. Um, it just happens, which is kind of crazy. Um, but also, this X-ray imaging technology has found the, the, the substance of the chamber itself to be a very rigid um, composition of different polymers, mm -hmm. um, which essentially stops it from dissolving itself. Um, and the team hopes that their findings may help in designing blast protection. Um, for even things like military operations, if you could create a suit out of substances which are strong enough to, you know, withstand boiling hydrochloric acid, it seems like a reasonably good idea to pursue. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's the kind of crazy, crazy first example. Um, the second one is much more common. So uh, I don't know if you've heard of this, but whales, when they beach themselves, occasionally they'll explode. Um, As in after they're dead or after was they're alive? Dead, yeah, yeah. So essentially this happens because gas builds up in the animal's stomach. Um, oh. I did actually have a look at this and I couldn't work out whether it's gas building up because it's being digested by bacteria or because... I assume it must be. No, yeah, I think it is, yeah. yeah. Probably. Like, yeah. So I think they digest it and it produces quite a lot of gases in, in, the, in the intestines. Yeah. And then it's just... Yeah. So, um, so the gas builds up in the animal's stomach, I think, because of the bacteria. Um, and this, this gas is normally methane. And occasionally, this builds up enough to cause the whale to explode. Um, but I did actually have a look. This doesn't normally occur naturally. So if you were to just leave a beach whale yeah. um, alone, normally the whale's skin and blubber is tough enough so that the explosions wouldn't occur naturally. The only reason that they 
do happen is that people maybe are like taking photos of the beach whale or like getting a little bit too close and like disrupting it or even like climbing oh, okay. on top of it um, to take a <laughs> selfie and then they'll be really unlucky. Classic. And, <laughs> yeah. Um, and with the, an, another main way in which it happens is like crews coming on to try and like remove the beach whale off of the oh. beach and like that sort of like mechanical disruption <laughs> is what causes skin to rupture and then the methane to explode. So it's, uh, it's kind of cheeky because it's not really an explosion which would occur naturally. Oh, okay. But yeah. It's kind of just occurring because of human disturbance. But nevertheless, quite a cool example. Um, my third um, example of an explosion in nature is a Cambrian explosion. So again, this is kind of cheeky of me because it's not an actual explosion, but instead it's the nickname of the event which occurred 540 million years ago. So um, essentially at this point, there was a massive explosion in life. Mm -hmm. um, so before this, there was only very simple, soft sea animals in the oceans um, and the very basic couldn't couldn't observe anything couldn't hunt just kind of like filter feeders that you, you, you imagine when you think of sort of sponges and corals and things like that and then suddenly 540 million years ago you had a massive onset of body plans which we see in the world today so um in fact every single animal phyla which is present on the earth now dates back to 540 million years ago. And it's left some scientists to suggest that no new animal phylas have emerged since. Um, so just for those that don't know, a phyla can be thought of as a grouping of animals. Um, and it's actually the highest grouping. So it groups, it's, it contains the most amount of animals per group. Um, and it's based on body plans. So animals with different body plans fall up to different phyla. And it's for that all the phyla today exist because they date back to the Cambrian explosion. Um, so trying to explain why this happened is pretty difficult. Why did we suddenly go from very simple life forms, which had existed for, um, well, life on Earth started 4.6 billion years ago, and this occurred only 540 million years ago. So there was a long period of mm -hmm. like stable life where nothing really changed, and then suddenly, bang, and we had tons of new life. Um, how did this occur? One explanation has been um, given to the rise in oxygen levels, which have been recorded at the time. So oxygen levels um, rose because when plants and cy cyanobacteria in the oceans photosynthesized, the oxygen previously was being absorbed by the rocks and the sediments around them. But essentially, as soon as that reaches saturation point, the oxygen begins to like be dispersed into the atmosphere and suddenly the concentration of atmospheric oxygen became much higher because the rocks had been saturated. And with um, a sudden rise in oxygen, um, animals could increase the size to which they could grow because suddenly the tissues wouldn't be starved of oxygen. So before, mm -hmm. if, if, if the animals would get very big, very complicated, there just wouldn't have been enough oxygen to allow them to respire enough right. to survive. Is that when they say, like, insects used to be huge? Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, um, the like size of a table. It's yeah. the worst nightmare. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they, yes, yeah, so they used to think, like, dragonflies and things used to be huge um, because atmospheric oxygen was a little bit higher not that right. long ago. Um, however, I, I did actually do a module on this in my second year, and that sort of theory has kind of been criticised recently. Yeah. So a group of scientists mapped exactly the levels of oxygen in the atmosphere and How? the size of... Oh, uh, they, they can do it... I think... I assume the way that they normally do it is, like, look at ice, don't they? Yeah, uh, they right. They look at, like, massive ice sheets, and they can drill down, and they could take air bubbles out right. and work out, okay, this air bubble was probably deposited 100 million years ago, and then they'll just analyse the composition of that air bubble. Right. Um, but essentially, the size of insects doesn't map on that well to the oxygen levels at the time. So that... Yeah. Like that Theories kind of come under a lot of criticism, and I think the new theory is that um, there was just basically not that many predators of insects around, so they could get really big. Whereas now there's a lot more, so like birds have evolved since, yeah. which would hunt insects. So 
I just kind of imagined everything was just a lot bigger. Yeah. Like, maybe get a giant bird mm. eating the giant. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, yeah, I often think that life has sort of shrunk. But I'm I not think sure that's made to... too many movies. Yeah, and like the blue whale is like the biggest animal ever to yeah. exist. So, and that is living. So, Is it biggest ever or is I it biggest so. currently? I, it is the biggest currently, but I think it might also be the biggest ever. Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know. I'm what about some sure. of the dinosaurs? What about uh, some of the oldest sharks? Yeah, and the big ones even bigger than great whites. Though. Yeah, I I have, I did. I'm pretty sure that the blue whale is the biggest ever. Yeah. Even though sharks were did were definitely much more massive. I don't think they ever were bigger than a blue whale. But anyway, yeah. So this is so one reason of the Cambrian explosion. One explanation is the rise in oxygen basically mm-hmm, lifted mm-hmm. that limit in body size. A second one has been proposed by scientist Andrew Parker, and he dated the beginning of eyesight um, at around the beginning of uh, the Cambrian explosion. So suddenly a nervous system evolved at that period for whatever reason. Like, you know, a mutation arose which allowed the, the, the uh, evolution of the eye. And suddenly the sort of interaction between predator and prey was sped up. So before before you could see, there wasn't that much that a predator could do. Whereas suddenly, if you have a visual input, the race between predator and prey could be sped up much quicker and um, prey suddenly needed to evolve lots of different defences. So camouflage, armour, different spines, um, for example. So that that's kind of one of... One of Mm -hmm. explanations Um, this has been criticised too though because some scientists think that these first eyes were just little eye spots and they could only really see sort of make out little shadows so they couldn't they weren't like our sort of eyes and they wouldn't have allowed a much more efficient pursuit of prey Um, but I I kind of like that explanation I think it's I just imagine the first animal getting some eyes though and how dominant yeah. it would have been it would have just blew their mind yeah it would have it would have been so easy to hunt suddenly if you could see yeah um a third theory is just that all the soft body sea animals which um were living before the cambrian explosion so the sort of sponges and the sea worms um basically they became extinct for whatever reason, maybe like a something like a comet hitting Earth, something like that, which has which we have just missed the evidence of. Um, so suddenly, all these soft bodies, all soft bodied organisms, um, died off, and this left a hole in which the more di- more complicated life could emerge. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know it's how quite I a tough one. I think yeah. when it's so far, like so long ago, it's quite hard to. Mm must be hard to study exactly yes but I, I, the thinking behind this theory is normally whenever we see um extinctions big extinctions another group suddenly yeah diversify so a good example is like when the dinosaurs went extinct mammals the, the mammals were like only represented by a couple of species yeah but suddenly as when the dinosaurs went there was massive niches which those mammals could fill and they radiated very quickly so i, I think that's kind of the thinking behind that. And I guess it's backed up because all the soft-bodied organisms beforehand couldn't be preserved in the fossil record. Because they're soft-bodied. Exactly. And then suddenly the the animals which took their place were the early skeletal, yeah. maybe like had some calcium carbonate shells, and the evidence is just biased slightly because all the new animals that emerged could be fossilised. But I guess... Could could there still be these soft bodies in the ocean that we just can't find? Like yeah, possibly deep ocean. Like, yeah. yeah. Did you watch the yeah. Planet Earth? <laughs> yeah. Like, I I just can't imagine what's down there. Exactly. Really. Exactly. It's so poorly understood. Yeah. I think um, David Attenborough said at the start of that episode that the deep ocean's less known about than the surface of Mars or something. Yeah. Like crazy. Um, so yeah, they could still be out there. Who knows? Um, I think. We're just about out of time, actually. Do you two have anything add to add to, which you'd like to add to that explosions in nature? No, I think that was no. that was pretty, that was a pretty That's good summarized. overview. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Out of a bang. Cool.
Yeah. Very nice. Okay, well, thank you very much for listening. Uh, join us next week. I'm not sure what next week next week's episode is on, actually. Yeah. I don't, I don't, maybe the topic hasn't been decided. Yeah, who knows? Tune in next week to find out. In the meantime, it's bye from me, Chris. Uh, me, Waylin. Uh, me, Ellie. Bye.